One of the most exciting things uh, for me, uh, my name's Nathan Howard, by the way, I'm an engineering project manager for Spray, and I've been working with the RDSI project um, and everyone up here, as well as a great many others, uh, to, to get to this point uh, for this kickoff. So we're all very excited and we're, we're uh, happy to be able to share this with all of you. But in addition to the, the technological innovations uh, and, and, and neat gadgets and flashing lights and buttons that we've seen, uh, there's quite a bit of collaboration and cooperation. So that's what we're trying to, to capture uh, with this session here, to talk about the, the, the diverse array of, of different organizations uh, that have participated in this project. So I, I'm going to let them uh, speak for themselves. But I just want to let you know that, at least at a personal level, it's been really uh, enlightening to be able to, to work with all of these folks. I think in the last uh, session, one of the questions was around uh, systems level and customer level. And I think that you'll see through this presentation that we've really brought those two together and been able to, to achieve success at both, both of those levels, both at the system level and the customer level. So with that, I'd like to um, ask Dennis Sumner uh, to, to come up and talk a little bit about uh, the role that uh, the city of Fort Collins has played. Um, he's a senior engineer uh, uh, for the utilities and a key member of the project management team, uh, and also the city and representing the city, who is the prime grantee for this project. Which, uh, as anyone who's been involved in, in government projects knows, that's quite a bit of responsibility. So, Dennis Sumner, everyone. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Uh, the city of Fort Collins is playing three roles in this project. The first one I'll speak to is the is the project leadership role. The RDSI project is a cooperative study with the Department of Energy. The city of Fort Collins is the, uh, is the prime recipient of the grant and the primary uh, responsible party for administering the grant. Our other partners are sub-recipients. That's DOE terminology. So it has a lot of meaning to them and we all live with it. In, in terms of the, uh, the broader picture of what the, the city's role with this, this project is, First, it gives us an opportunity to support the, uh, the kind of community we have. We had a lot of talk about, about what the, the leadership is that we have in this community, the kinds of, of businesses we have in this community, the, the involvement of Colorado State University, and so on and so forth. And, and the city is honored to be able to have an, an opportunity to help orchestrate this project with all of these different members. The uh, project is characterized locally as the Fort Zed Jumpstart Project. Fort Zed has been alluded to, the uh, uh, Zero Energy District, long-term goal for the, uh, this portion of the community, and the RDSI project is the first step in trying to help realize that long-term goal. And also the economic development opportunity. Also, uh, it's obvious you do an $11.2 million project. You bring in a little bit, half of that from, from the federal government into the local community, and it has economic benefits. The uh, second hat that the city of Fort Collins plays in this project is the electric utility. We have a community-owned electric utility. It puts us in a really nice position. We're in, in a relatively unique position where our customers and our owners are one and the same. We don't have to try to balance competing interests of, of stockholders, etc. Our mission is, is clear and simple. Our job is to do the best possible job we can for our customers. In, in that capacity, the project that we're doing is giving us increased experience and knowledge in terms of how to, how to work with, how to interact with, how to support distributed energy resources that are becoming more and more important as we move to the future, as we expand the use of photovoltaic equipment, as we see evolving technologies, fuel cells, and so on. We want to be in a position where we can support our customers' innovations and, and interests in those areas. The demand side management, uh, a lot of you are very familiar with that. Basically what we're talking about is being able to reduce loads at times of system peak. That's a very important and critical part of this project. We've had active demand side management programs in Fort Collins since the early 80s, and this is simply an expansion of, of that, getting a little bit deeper and a little bit more involved with our customers. And then finally, we get the opportunity in this project to, to apply pad-mounted switchgear application at the Integrid Lab. This is a, a fairly large uh, system device that will help us to be able to, 
to, to monitor the generation at the lab. The lab is able to generate up to two megawatts of electrical energy. If you have a two megawatt generation resource on the end of a circuit that has a peak load of, of say seven megawatts and can have a minimum load of three megawatts, that has a pretty substantial impact on all of the, all of the loads and all the customers on that circuit. And we're experimenting with technology to help us be able to ensure that we provide the highest level of service for all customers on that circuit. Finally, City of Fort Collins is a customer. City of Fort Collins has municipal buildings, and in that capacity, our, our operations folks have been actively involved in the project. Some of the things that they have done, one is we have modified some uh, hybrid vehicles so that they are, are, are going to be able to operate both as an electric vehicle or as a hybrid vehicle. What that means is we've added Gener or added battery capacity to a conventional hybrid vehicle as well as adding generation or, or adding the, the ability to charge those batteries with a connection to the electric system. In this project, what we're doing is we're able to turn off the charging to those vehicles at times of electric system peak. Since the vehicles are hybrid, their use ability remains the same. If the battery's not charged, it runs on, on conventional fuel. Demand-side management, city has a number of facilities that we've been able to expand demand-side management with in this project. As with all other participants in the project, we have the, the one-year DOE project to look at reducing system peak. But because of the pricing signals that we provide to customers at the retail level, there's a substantial economic incentive for reducing a customer's peak. And that will be a long-term benefit that all of our customers will see from the project. And then finally, we are increasing our, our knowledge and ability with uh, parallel generation. At, at our city hall facility, we have a 500 kW generator with the equipment being provided by both Woodward Governor and Eaton. We're able to synchronize that generator so that we can operate it parallel with the electric system. In the long term, that probably will not be what's done with that equipment. That's a diesel generator and there's a good chance that we won't choose to operate the diesel in the long term. In the short term, we're learning about how to, to synchronize equipment, how to operate the equipment, how to control it remotely as well as locally. When the project's over, what we'll be able to do with the equipment that was installed there is to be able to restore power after a power outage without having to have a second outage. As those of you who are in the electric industry know, whenever you have a power outage, the system goes black, you turn on your emergency generation, then you restore power to your facility. Once the electric system returns to power, you have a second outage because you're not synchronized and go back to the utility system. With the investment that's being made, the synchronizing capability that we have, we'll be able to avoid that second outage from here on into the future. So that's the role of the City of Fort Collins. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, next, I'd like to um, have Steve Balderson, uh, the fil Facilities Operation Manager uh, for Larimer, Larimer County, uh, to talk about some of the things uh, that the county is involved in uh, with the project. Uh, Steve, if you could step up. Thank you. Uh, Larimer County is um, acting as a demonstration site as one of the partners here on the grant, uh, both at our uh, Larimer County Courthouse offices on Oak Street, as well as the uh, Larimer County Justice Center down at 201 LaPorte. Uh, the two projects that we're uh, participating with are uh, a PV system and then some demand side management. Um, at the end of the day, I think all the benefits that Larimer County is going to receive will be uh, both the improved efficiencies that we'll be able to operate at and all the partnerships that we've uh, established with the other entities and partners in the grant that will carry on outside just the uh, smart grid part of the project, but also in other areas that we operate in. And then um, we're also proud to be uh, part of the Fort Zed district and doing our part. Thanks.
Thank you, Steve. Uh, next up, we have another Steve. Uh, anyone who's familiar with the project knows there's actually about a Steve in every organization. So uh, in addition to having CSU alum involved, uh, apparently Steves are also highly sought after. Anyway, uh, this particular one is Steve Holton. Um, he is the Assistant Director for Facilities Management. Um, and uh, he, he's going to talk a little bit about the role uh, that RDSI has played in advancing uh, their energy efficiency goals uh, and, 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 and how that's going to play out in the long term for them. Uh, Steve? Uh, thank you. Um, actually, it's a pleasure to be here, and this is really an exciting opportunity for facilities to be recognized. I think I know that within the university, we actually have three partners that are participating in the RDS side. We have the teaching side, the research side, and actually facilities. And uh, we partner a lot with our engineering departments and such. But I think what facilities brings to this opportunity here is uh, we own assets. We own tools, toys, equipment, things that we can connect to and that we manage and operate every day. But really, we have simply three different systems that um, that shed load, whether it's our fountain, which is our bellwether indicator on our main campus outside of the physics building, the engineering wing. We have a fountain. When, that, when the grid is under stress, you know, either physically or just in modeling it, that fountain will go off, reducing 21 kW of power, saving us money, but also uh, as a signal to the campus that we're trying to depower and, and stabilize the grid. And then we have a collection of fans and pumps that control the air systems and the hydronic systems in our buildings, and those will be shed too. Then we have about five generation uh, opportunities. Uh, our bread and butter one is a steam turbine. Uh, our steam plant has, produces steam for heating the building, but we also spin some power as we drop the steam pressure. We have uh, several photovoltaic systems. Uh, I'd have to make a plug a little bit off. At Foothills, we have a 5.3 megawatt array system that's a partnership with a private enterprise in Excel. But here on this Fort Zed grid, what we have is two buildings we brought in, our, our parking garage on Prospect and Center Avenue. That's a 132 kilowatt system. And our engineering building has uh, another um, 19 or so. And then we have two generators that we're learning about, as Dennis said, parallel generation, syncing it, and bringing it up in order to reduce our, our, our load during those times. But I think also what, um, what Nathan asked me to comment on is, you know, what are the benefits that we're seeing as partners? And I'd like to comment that, you know, uh, CSU has this long and deep, rich history of energy conservation, uh, of being green and, and, and leader in our own industries of uh, innovative solutions. We've had uh, energy projects for 30 years. I've been at the school for 25 and have seen those come and go. Um, we, we're kind of a big player. We have over 25 megawatts with our three campuses and, and over $8 million a year in purchase power. Uh, so we seek economic benefit out of that, but we also know that we have an, an ability to really help this local grid in a community benefit and, and, sh and shedding load and stabilizing the grid and bringing about all this benefit that uh, the, the community needs, in particular Fort Zed. So I think we're a real good partner in this because we have a, a staff of a lot of electricians, control people, engineers, and in management that can bring these assets into the grid and, and apply our expertise. But really the final benefit is the fact that we're able to educate ourselves. We're very familiar with building automation systems. We use Johnson Controls, Siemens, and other ones. And now we're able to, I think, go up to the next step, the next level, which is now looking at the grid level you know, local community, regional, and maybe state level, where we can help participate. And for sure, we'll learn this new software, and we're looking forward to the transparency that uh, grid management will bring. I know, as a side note, we're, we're going to be dabbling or mo moving into, um, you know, motivational uh, programs to get the occupants in the buildings to reduce their energy use, maybe during peak times, maybe just for reduced emissions, energy savings. But we've learned that you really need to have, you know, real-time data coming back to whether it's the students or the faculty or their staff, maybe a shared savings program. But the end-of-the-month billing really doesn't add up anymore. You need to see it real-time. That's really the incentives that we can see. So I think our learning curve is going to bring that level of, of transparency and, and metering data to us and to our customers. So I think really that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to build on the success the university's had before and move to this next tier. And God, it's been really exciting to uh, you know, be part of all this and work with everybody here. So thank you.
Thank you, Steve. Uh, next up, we'll kind of uh, talk about one of those other hats uh, that he mentioned that CSU is wearing uh, in terms of uh, testing and research. Uh, Dan Zimmerly is an associate professor at CSU's Engine and Energy Conversion Lab. Uh, I hope uh, many of you had a chance to, to visit that facility. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of very exciting stuff going on there, in addition to the smart grid uh, things that we're highlighting today. Uh, so, Dan, if you could say a few words, please. Thank you. Uh, so thank, thanks for having me today, and I also want to thank the uh, City of Fort Collins for their sponsorship in, in building this project out, uh, and the other companies who've added equipment and added to the uh, facility that we can build at CSU. So uh, to back up a little bit, we have sort of two roles at the Engines Lab. One role is we're part of the demonstration project, and so we've kind of done a back to the future thing where the building we're in right now is an old power plant building, and we're going to again be something of a power plant building. Uh, we won't be quite at the 10 megawatts it was when it was decommissioned, uh, but we're going to be up close to 2 megawatts by the time this, this whole thing is done. Uh, and as part of the demonstration facility, we're sort of unique in that we've added in some resources specifically dedicated to this project, and we've also added in some unusual resources like waste heat and uh, a dual fuel generator set to our, our mix. Um, but the, probably the biggest impact for us on the demonstration project side has been uh, its ability to catalyze other work that we can do at CSU. So if you looked at a Venn diagram of all of the research universities that would like to have energy on their subtitle, uh, which was a small Venn diagram a few years back but has become popular lately, so it's a big diagram now, uh, of those, there's very few of them that can say they have a dedicated power research facility. And then there's uh, very, very few of them that they can say they can operate at a megawatt. Okay? And really, this project and the projects like this has given us the opportunity to be completely unique on that research front. And so the result of the work on the RDSI project has been to catalyze a whole series of other efforts, other research efforts, in addition to the work that we've been doing on this project. And, you know, you all had to listen to me once before, so I won't go through the whole list again, uh, but if you're interested in the specific items, just catch me afterward and I can go, well, I can go way too long on all those projects. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next up, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, New Belgium. Um, and. Uh, not quite yet. New Belgium's next, and then we'll then we'll go to you. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to to get a dedicated presenter for this session, uh, but we've worked closely with them. Uh, many of you are very familiar uh, with their work, uh, but uh, uh, almost um, at the same level as their beer production is their uh, mission and sustainability. And uh, there's a really uh, great alignment uh, with this project and what uh, New Belgium has identified as uh, their energy philosophy. And, and you can see down at the base, the, the largest portion that they see as uh, their target areas to be able to, to, to reach their, their energy philosophy goals is in uh, conservation primarily and also in on-site generation. And so New Belgium is, um, been able to to use this project as a way to to further those goals. They've already done quite a bit, and this has allowed them to to go even further. The 200 uh, kW solar array uh, comes up a lot, uh, but it's also about looking at uh, the loads um, that they have, uh, industrial loads and and capacity. Uh, one of the neat things in working with New Belgium is they went through and did a very intensive survey of the types of loads that they had in their facility. Uh, and, and looking at what they could use uh, to be able to provide dispatchable load reduction for this, this project. And as part of that, there was a lot of things that didn't make the list, uh, that weren't uh, feasible at the end of the, uh, the process, but that learning, that going through that and being involved in that, um, I think provided them with uh, some very valuable insight into to how they operate, into the things that they do every day, uh, whether it's bottled beer or, or you know, uh, you know, do kegs or, you know, the, the whole process. So 
I think just working with them, that was one of the things maybe as a <laughs> industrial engineer at CSU uh, um, that, that was really interesting to me. And they also found some new things as part of that process that they've been able to bring on uh, with some of the thermal storage. So uh, we want to recognize them. And uh, again, uh, hopefully you had a chance to visit and get some more detail uh, uh, at the site visits this morning. So that uh, kind of wraps up um, the this, this site partners. Now, the other key partners that we have are the technology partners. Um, and they are the ones that have worked across the board with the actual asset owners, with the sites, uh, to be able to enable a lot of these technologies. And the first one that we'd like to, uh, to have up uh, and talk a little bit about the work that they've done is Woodward Governor. Uh, we have Franz uh, Westerbrink, the VP of Marketing and Business Development, for their engine systems. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Woodward is an international company headquartered right here in Fort Collins, uh, both in energy and aerospace. So, welcome. Uh, Woodward is in a very old company, but since I think four years we were headquartered in Fort Collins. We're about uh, approaching $2 billion uh, international business, and we employ about 5,000 people from probably 1,000 to 1,200, depends on the econ economic cycle, in the Fort Collins and Loveland area. Um, our business is uh, around probably half about air aircraft business or aerospace and half about energy, energy conversion. Um, our energy business uh, is driven by typically five kind of key drivers. Um, first of all, you know, energy growth in the, in, the, in the world is, there's no stopping to it. It's just the population is growing, uh, you know, significantly, um, but at the same time the middle class is growing, so the energy per person is growing. So um, as we focusing on, on energy growth, um, we try, we, one of our Pillars is basically how can we basically reduce the amount of fuels to create that energy, and a lot of it is about efficiency gains. Um, we are involved in uh, reduction of harmful emissions. What we call harmful emissions are not the CO2, but the others, NOx, CO, and uh, we do a lot of that in the world. We are involved in most of the uh, gas uh, gas turbines, the dry low NOx turbines, from two, of, two of them are in the, in the rawhide plant here. But worldwide, we, we, we are involved in a lot of the direct harmful reduction of harmful emissions. We have converted all of the, the buses in, uh, in Seoul, uh, 11 million people there, measurable reduction in, in pollution in the air. Uh, we're doing that in uh, Shanghai, in Ganzhou, uh, New Delhi, in, in India. So. It's, it's one of the key drivers. Um, the U.S. is a lot ahead of that with pollution of, natu of, of you know, transportation. The rest of the world, that's a whole different story. The other is focus on global warming. CO2 reduction is the kind of things. And smart grid is, is an essential tool of doing kind of all these projects. So we, we're involved with that. <coughs> Energy independence. Um, you know, the governor was talking about it. Energy independence is one of the key drivers that, that we believe in strongly. Uh, just using natural gas instead of fossil fuels will have a tremendous effect. So if, if you know, it's pretty, pretty doable in a short amount of time to not have any need for oil out of the Middle East in the U.S. It's just, it's both fossil fuel, but changing fossil fuels is, is a major effect. And a lot of countries have basically driving their whole energy policies around fuel independency. And the last one is the electricity infrastructure upgrade and the upgrades. <coughs> about, if you took it, look at all of the energy converted in the world, about one-third of that energy transport through the electricity grid. Um, with all the indicators, probably with the growth of energy demand, the electricity grid will grow to about half of that. So there's a double kind of growth of the elect electricity grid and there's a high demand on the, on the flexibility of that grid. So that drives basically all the things that we're working on. So we're working on renewable control of renewable equipment. We're also working on control of better use of fossil fuels. So what did we do on, uh, on the RDSI program? First of all, we, uh, we have been providing um, control systems to uh, the new Belgian brewery. So this is the engine running on the uh, methane coming from the waste. And uh, not only did we provide a new control system for using that 
biomethane more reliably, but also the abil ability to, news, to use natural gas to blend in with it. So it basically gives a much wider use of that engine than only when the biofuel bio is available. Um, we uh, provide a significant amount of, or several uh, uh, components to basically upgrade the different engines that was talked about to be able to get to the grid, and it can be synchronized as uh, new control equipment. And the last one, we, uh, we helped in converting the diesel engine at CSU from, uh, diesel and from diesel to dual fuel, so it can run on diesel and natural gas. And it makes a lot more sense if you're continuously going to run that during the peak hours. So what, what we like about participating in this program, and hopefully a lot of programs that come out of this, we strongly believe in a community effort. Um, we, it allows us to close to home, uh, develop some of the technologies and demonstrate these. And I'm, rep I'm in marketing and business development, and so although it's great that we develop these, the marketing effect is, uh, is extremely strong. We're getting customers from all over the world visiting. We try to, to stop our meetings at 4 o'clock, step in the car, go to New Belgium. Of course, we only look at the engine. That's the only thing we do there. <laughs> but uh, it's provided a very good marketing tool. And uh, it gives a very, very strong message. Uh, if basically you get customers from all over the world over, you say, you know, this is the kind of news technology. You know what? We demonstrate it in our own community, in, a big, in our own backyard. So the fact that people see it working, they see the kind of energy coming out of this cluster, it's a, it's a huge marketing tool, and it's something <coughs> we hope to, uh, to be involved in much, much bigger in the future than we have been. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that. Uh, Next uh, technical partner that we'd like to um, have talk about their work is uh, Advanced Energy. We have uh, Todd Miklos here, uh, who is uh, their director of marketing, um, and they have uh, provided uh, one of their advanced inverters for the, the large solar array on New Belgium. Um, and I'd like Todd to talk about that and, and some of its uh, smart grid ready capabilities. Uh, thank you, Todd. Hi, and thanks for sticking around. Uh leading up to happy hour today. So again, I'm Todd Miklos with Advanced Energy, and I am wearing the company colors under my coat here, so um, I feel very official in uh, representing Advanced Energy today. Uh, we are based in Fort Collins. We've been, uh, we were founded in Fort Collins almost 30 years ago, and uh, we continue to have our world headquarters uh, on the east side of town. So you might ask, what's a solar inverter? Um, and since we have different levels, I think, of almost any understanding, let me recap that. A solar inverter uh, changes the shape of the electricity that comes off the solar panel, so it comes into the grid. Uh, very simply, the solar panels act like giant batteries that change their output based on how much the sun is shining. And of course, the grid is alternating current, which goes back and forth. 60 times a second, a lot faster than a person can move their hand. So it's kind of a complicated problem. You have to take this and turn it into that. And so that's what a solar inverter does. So uh, Advanced Energy adapted some of uh, some earlier product lines, entered the uh, solar inverter market about five years ago. And when we did, we launched the most efficient solar inverter products of their class available in the entire United States. And those are designed and built here in Fort Collins. So. Um, it was a good opportunity for advanced energy. Some of our other products make computer chips and, and flat screens and so forth. Not a lot of that happening in Fort Collins. So when the opportunity came to participate in the RDSI program, and we jumped at the chance. So up on the screen here, you'll see a picture of the product. It's that uh, a white cabinet. And uh, w when you take the tour at New Belgium, and that's not if, but when, you should definitely do that. Um, and you walk through the facility as you go to the bottling um, building, you'll see that on the west side. And it sits there every day and waits for the sun to come up. And when it does, it starts going like this and it works hard all day and tries to put as much electricity out as it can and then turns off. So what is Advanced Energy doing besides providing this box that flips electricity back and forth? Well, we uh, provided some consulting, some training. Uh, the process of putting a solar array on a a building roof is actually a fairly non-trivial thing. It involves design, layout, optimization, et cetera. So we provided consulting to do that. And going forward, um, when the uh, 
the smart grid gets exercised throughout the year, we actually have the ability to change how the inverter acts. So it may be, for example, that the, the grid needs the solar inverter to not put out quite as much power as it can in bright sunshine. And so the, the controllers from Spire and the city will be able to send a command that says, whoa, the clouds just parted, you're putting out way too much power, why don't you throttle that back for the moment and run it, say, 70%. That we would be able to do something like that to help keep the grid stable. Another thing that we can do that is a little counterintuitive, but it's important in utility is on AC, there's this other kind of electricity known as reactive power. And it, it, it's not worth explaining except to say that there's real power and there's this other thing called reactive power. And you have to keep the reactive power in line and to help make sure that everybody's real power stays nice and clean. And the inverter actually has the ability to um, assist in keeping the reactive power under control. And so that command capability is also there uh, for, the, for the use of the smart grid experimentation. So we're kind of on uh, standby right now to move to that next level of control. And so we'll be participating in 2011 as needed to get that uh, full functionality implemented. So that's our piece of that. And then I, I, I did check that, you know, after all this, there will be some products offered that were bottled with the help of advanced energy <laughs> solar inverters. So you should try, try that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, next up, we'd like to um, have Rob Redfoot from uh, Eaton Incorporated. Eaton is an uh, international manufacturer of electronic components. Uh, and for this project, uh, they have uh, contributed quite a bit of knowledge and technology in terms of the, the switch gear, uh, which is what's used to help the backup generators parallel to the grid and, and really participate uh, in this project. So uh, Rob Redfoot. Thanks, Nathan. Um, just a little background on Eaton. Uh, we might not be as well known as some of the other companies here, but Eaton is a fairly large multinational company. We employ about 60,000 people worldwide. We're, I think in 2009, our net sales were about $12 billion. We are headquartered in Ohio. Uh, we were founded in 1911. And I'm not telling you this, we're not trying to brag up Eaton or anything like this, but I think it gives a little perspective of how important this product, this project was for us as a company to be involved with, because it is really important. When we were, I think, given the opportunity by Woodward to come in and supply some gear, which we did for Dan. We brought Dan down to our facility in Aurora. Um, we built, I don't know, several switchboards uh, for Dan and then several, uh, several switchboards for CSU in the city of Fort Collins also. But for Eaton as a, as a company that's providing power solutions, it's so important for us to stay on the cutting edge of what's out there. And this project represented a chance to, to partner with, with people that are on the cutting edge and to learn about paralleling generators and distributed generation and just all the other things that you've heard about today. So this is an important project. It's an important project for us as a company to be involved with. And I think it's an important project for, for the, city, or the city of Fort Collins, the state of Colorado, and for the country. Just to, we need, we need these other sources of energy. It's not all about oil and gas, but it's, uh, it's about distributed generation and using renewable resources. So I want to thank, take a minute to thank everybody that, everybody that's all the companies represented up here. Uh, it was a good experience for me to be involved and I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next up, I'd like to um, have uh, Steve Brunner, another one of our Steves, uh, come and talk uh, a little bit about the role that the Brendel Group uh, has played. Uh, you've heard uh, Judy Dorsey talk a little bit in some of her other hats, uh, but uh, the Brendel Group has been a, a, another key partner, uh, and Steve uh, is also a fellow member of the project management team, has played an integral role in helping us understand uh, some of the impacts of this project. Uh, and so he's going to share some of those with you today. Steve. I'm, I'm convinced the only reason I was, uh, I'm able to be part of this project is because my name is Steve. And uh, I feel fortunate, you know, nothing against Fred's, but if my name were Fred, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, Brendel Group's role in this project has been and is. Uh, you met Judy Dorsey earlier. Obviously, she has quite the vision. Uh, I wanted to point out Julie Seaving in the back here. Uh, they were a big part of the vision of Fort Zed and RDSI along, they worked uh, closely with Spiray and the city and others to get this whole project going. 
Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to be on the implementation side, and we really have three tasks in the implementation of this project. The first being helping um, the other Steves and, and their, uh, their entities um, identify and quantify the demand side management aspects of um, this, this project. There are about 850 KW of DSM assets in this project. <clears throat> Another one is um, helping to answer the question, well, how much does the smart grid cost? And this graphic here shows um, the, the installed cost dollars per KW of uh, a project. Uh, and we broke them up into demand side management projects, genset controls, um, plug-in hyperelectric vehicles, and photovoltaics. And I just want to point out that these costs, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, include a, a lot of things other than just equipment. There's project management. Um, you might look at photovoltaics and say, boy, that's higher than what uh, I paid to put on my rooftop. Uh, and one of the large projects, that includes some structural um, uh, entities that go in, into this. Um, also, I want to point out that on genset controls, that does not include the cost of the genset itself, but that, that includes the, just the cost of the control to... to um, to hook that up. Uh, another thing we did is uh, help try to answer the question, well, how green is the smart grid? But what we did is this is, and I want to um, emphasize that this is what we anticipate right now in doing some preliminary modeling of this demonstration year. So we're looking at, uh, on the, the y-axis, the um, emissions reductions or emissions impact in uh, carbon dioxide in tons per year for this project by those different categories again. Um, you can see obviously PV is a, is a big drop. Um, a lot of this has to do with the number of hours that PV is operating in, in the year, somewhere around 1,500 hours versus uh, demand side management projects, which may be only <clears throat> controlled about 350 hours per year. Um, there has been some discussion on emissions. Well, you know, how, how can turning on generators be green? Um, the overall impact of all of these in the project or in the demonstration year is quite a, a big uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And any diesel genset offset is you know, less than 10% of the total amount. And uh, we have a little booth over here and be happy to uh, talk about uh, any of these and answer any other questions that we have. Thanks. So, um, so as you can see, I mean, just uh, just looking at the group here and and the experiences that, that they've shared with the project, there's quite a bit of, of diversity, um, uh, both uh, in terms of partners, but also in terms of assets. As you can see from some of the screens uh, that we're showing right now and that, that you've seen earlier during the launch. All of those are, are different types of, of assets. We have generation, we have load reduction, we have uh, photovoltaics, we have electric vehicles, we have uh, fuel cells, uh, you know, all of these different things. And, and how do you pull those together? And that's where, um, you know, the smart grid technology comes in. Uh, but it's also that technology being applied in a collaborative manner with uh, the entities that are, that are involved. Uh, working over the last year and a half uh, with these folks on a regular basis and having the conversations and learning together about um, how, do, how do we bring these, um, these things all together uh, from an organizational point of view, from a technological point of view, to be able to achieve the project goals um, has been pretty awesome. Uh, and, and we look forward uh, to the demonstration year, being able to, uh, to continue those interactions and really be able to showcase how uh, impactful uh, this can be. Um, and so I think we'll go ahead and open this up for, for Q&A to, to get, give you all an opportunity to, to ask us. Uh, maybe um, you know you're looking at a uh, different type of technology, or your organization is in a similar place. How do I fit into Fort Zed? Dennis, you mentioned um, when you spoke about uh, significant or substantial financial incentives for time of use pricing. Yes. Um, what type of analysis did you do, and and what did you find was kind of the? Is it making an impact in in I guess the the overall um, decision to 
to change behavior? Let me answer that question without directly answering it, if I may. The, the, the participants, the site partners in this project are, are on what we call coincident pricing rates, a retail rate that we call a coincident pricing rate. What that amounts to is customers' bill is made up of three components. One is energy, traditional energy use. The other is a demand component, and that is non-coincidental non demand at their facility. That cost is around 2 to $3 per kW. The, the energy component is in the neighborhood of two and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And then the third component is what we call a coincident demand. And this has to do with the, the customer's contribution to the system peak. What, what is the load that they're imposing on transmission and generation? And that's fairly substantial uh, in terms of cost. That, that's approximately $13 per kW. So uh, Steve Holton from CSU spoke earlier and talked about their, their electric bill of around $8 million a year. Um, the, I think they pay the city about $6 million of that. The other part's probably Excel. Much less energy, I might add, but um, in, 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 in any event. <laughs> that was, he said lower quality, but um, of, that, of that approximately $6 million a year that they pay for electricity, approximately $3 million of that is for what their use is during 12 hours in the year. So there's a pretty substantial economic incentive that the, that the rate provides to, to try to go after that, that coincident peak. We've had that kind of pricing for our, our commercial customers for over 10 years. And as a result of that, we've gotten a tremendous response. The, the responses are all over the place. We have a, a, a small uh, feed, feed operation that, that actually turns their operation upside down in terms of they're, they're able to shift hours of production. So they just stay away from peak time periods. It's, our peak time periods are weather driven. There's a significant consistent pattern in terms of what's going on. And from that pattern, we have customers who take it to the extreme of, of they, just, they just basically don't do heavy operations during peak times. We have another uh, shop, uh, and a, uh, a metal shop, that has a, a bright light that they have turned on when we're having times of, of peak. We have uh, residential customers. We've had an electric water heater control program since the, since the early 80s, where we, we turn off the heating elements to electric water heaters. We refer to that as our hotshot program. When that signal goes out, that's when that light goes on in, in those commercial shops that I was talking about. So this program just fits right into that perfectly. We just expand the, the resources that are available. There's a, there's a very strong economic incentive. We're just beginning. Uh, the governor just started the, uh, the RDSI project, so I really can't tell you in terms of the RDSI project what has been the operational experience, but we expect it to be substantial and the investments that are being made in this, this project will then continue to benefit the, the site partners for the years to come. If I can uh, just add to that, this is a perfect example uh, kind of going back to uh, the conversation around system level benefits versus customer level benefits. The RDSI project, um, as envisioned by the Department of Energy, was focused on uh, infrastructure, looking at uh, reducing the peak load on a particular piece of infrastructure, in this case, the Linden Tech substation across the street. But we very quickly realized as we began our conversations with the partners that the same dispatchable controls that the smart grid enables allowed them to more effectively manage their electricity consumption and save uh, quite a bit of money on, on their bills. So uh, again, that there's, there's multiple benefits that we see from this technology. Uh, any other questions? Uh, one question that, that others have asked is, has asked about challenges in the project, and it gives me an opportunity to, uh, to speak to a couple of different things. This, this project was conceived and put together in the 2006-2007 time frame, and as many of you may recall, the economic conditions that we were in at that time frame were a whole lot different than what they were in the last few years. And over the last few years, it's been a pretty tough economic situation. One of the first impacts of that for us on this project was so shortly after the DOE announced that we had the award, one of our partners, Caterpillar, had to withdraw. They were going to uh, participate providing a 600 kW generation unit. They were going to donate half the value of that, and DOE matching funds was, were going to be the other half. That put us in a bit of a bind right at the very beginning of the project. 
And I'm delighted to, to share with you that the Van Dyne Super, Super Turbo, they've got their, their setup here in the, in the back corner. This is a spinoff from Woodward Governor that's been doing some testing on, on a turbo supercharger that's application actually is on uh, long haul vehicles, 18 wheelers, to be able to improve their efficiency. But in that marketplace, you have to demonstrate that your equipment works. You have to have millions of hours logged on your equipment. And what they had done is they set up some, some equipment, some generation at the Intergrid lab. They were operating independent of this project and generating electricity. With this dilemma that we had with Woodward, or not Woodward, excuse me, with Caterpillar, with losing Caterpillar, we approached Van Dyne, said, is there any chance you'd like to uh, participate in our project? I can't offer you anything, but maybe a chance to get a little profile and a little goodwill. And uh, to our delight, they jumped at it. Their contribution was able to make up for the, the energy we lost, for the capacity we lost, then the matching funds we've been able to use to increase the delivery capacity at the Integrid Lab so that they can have a larger uh, connection with the electric system. And as Dan mentioned earlier, to be able to shift that from a little less than a megawatt to in the range of two megawatts substantially enhances what can be done at the lab, substantially brings benefit to the community, and, and thanks to uh, Van Dyne, we were able to make what looked like a pretty difficult situation into a, into a positive outcome. The other thing that I'd like to just mention in that same context is that for our partners, the downturn in the economy has meant a lot. What Steve Holton failed to tell you was that they've lost a lot of staff. When it snows, Steve and his staff shovel snow at CSU because they don't have other people to shovel snow at CSU. So they've got plenty of other things on their plate in addition to when Dennis calls and says, hey guys, we got this project I need you to work on. And, and I can't say enough about the, uh, the mentality, the support, the positive attitude that the, that the partners have shown to help make this project work. And we spent a lot of time talking about technology and about smart meters and about one thing or another, but I think the real guts of what makes this innovation work and what we need to go into the future is, is the, the kind of positive spirit and drive that, that our team has shown. Uh, hi, I'm David Hiller with the Collaboratory. Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of things since you just flipped the switch and, and uh, started this uh, running a couple of hours ago, but I'm curious to know if there's a, the, uh, the next stage already uh, in planning to expand uh, Fort Zed or to, uh, to try some new things with it. Okay. Um, so uh, this... Maybe I talk about I can talk about this in context. Um, uh, you know, I don't uh, have a timeline for you in terms of of how the, the larger uh, Fort Zed uh, project is is going to roll out. I mean, that's that's a work in progress. Uh, but this is this is you know as we call it the Fort Zed jumpstart. This provides uh, uh, opportunity to showcase and experiment with and demonstrate uh, the core infrastructure that's necessary to be able to. Uh, enable a smart grid project like Fort Zed. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a, a big focus on renewable energy um, in Fort Zed, but there's also uh, equal to that a focus on energy consumption uh, reduction. And so to be able to truly achieve a zero energy district, uh, it's a lot easier to, uh, to actually save energy and conserve energy uh, than it is to, to necessarily generate. As the slide that uh, Steve Brunner had, had showed us, um, the, the cost uh, of installing dispatchable load reduction is, is significantly less than actual generation. Now, they both have equal, you know, important parts to play, uh, but that's one of the, the early learnings that, that we've seen uh, from this RDSI project that we will uh, apply in the future f as Fort Zed expands. So hopefully that, that comes close to answering your question. Uh, so next up, we'll have uh, Sunil, uh, I think, has a few uh, remarks uh, before we move on to the next stage. So I'd like to finally thank all of the folks, again, uh, both for being up here today and, and all the hard work that these organizations and uh, these folks, individuals, has, have put into this project. So thank you, guys. I think the, the one thought that kept going through my mind as I was listening to the panel was, uh, came, came back to the same theme from this morning about collaboration. But this time it had a slightly different spin on it because uh, if you listen to it, you know, what was the one common recurring theme that came back almost uh, across the board? It was actually New Belgium brewing. You know? <laughs> I think there's something there. 
and 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 the one thing that occurred to me was that I think Eaton was probably the only party that did not mention that uh, enough times. They're not spending enough time in Fort Collins. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, so we we have a you know we we had a great um, afternoon here and heard a lot of different perspectives. So uh, at the risk of uh, repeating the thanking that has been going around uh, going around uh, all day, uh, I'd like to thank all the people that helped put this together, sponsoring this event itself, uh, the City of Fort Collins. Uh, we had the Clean Energy Cluster, we had the Governor's Energy Office, um, and uh, of course, uh, Spire was uh, you know, in the, right in the middle of all of that. So I want to thank all of them for uh, making this a uh, reality. We invited a lot of people. Uh, we had limitations in space and whatnot, and then, of course, the level of interest we got was just phenomenal. We were just blown away. And uh, we, we started off thinking maybe we won't, we won't be able to fill this room. But by the end of it, we were thinking this was only half the size of what, 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 what was actually needed. So that was, uh, uh, that was phenomenal. Uh, so, um, so the event itself, you know, uh, hopefully gave you a really good idea about uh, the RDSI project and uh, uh, its, uh, uh, its role in a, in a lot of different, uh, uh, different areas. You know, coming back to David's question about how uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this might expand, I just want to touch on um, uh, one aspect of that, which I think is uh, probably very interesting to, uh, to many of you. As we think of projects like this, you do have the issue, you know, there are m so many aspects to this thing. What you really need is a framework to, or a skeleton to hang your different things on. So if every single project is a different initiative in its own right, it can only go so far. But if you have a way to sort of seamlessly blend these things together, then you can expand and uh, somewhat uh, opportunistically where you can from a funding perspective and whatnot, but also be strategic about the overall direction. In the Ford Z case, we're already in discussions about various projects. I, I don't think we were able to share uh, uh, other things that are going on outside of this RDSI project, but, but there are other pro initiatives and projects going on as well. So the key is that you have a, you have a general framework you can add different projects to that and amplify what you can actually do. And that model, if you can actually get that right, I think that will probably be the most compelling part of how you can scale and replicate in different areas as well. So just a, just a, just a thought about how you put projects like this together. And of course, these different projects from electric vehicle projects to um, uh, renewables projects, as they come together, hopefully the, the skeleton that we have actually shown you today will be able to support those projects and actually expand over time. So now I'd like to transition to the next uh, part of the event here. Uh, we are in a brand new building, and uh, I think as I may have mentioned this in the morning, I don't think we even had an occupancy permit when we had to come in and start pu putting things up, up in here. So it's brand new, uh, brand new in here. And uh, we have uh, um, uh, um, Darren Atterbury is going to come up here and uh, tell us a little bit about this building and the, uh, and the city's perspectives in that area, uh, followed by um, uh, we have uh, Mark Forsythe, the CEO of uh, Innosphere, uh, will give you uh, will give you some thoughts about the building as well. With that, I'll turn this over to Darren uh, to uh, to kick off the next uh, part of this event. Thanks, Darren. Okay, I was told that my role was to say there's a party outside, and and <laughs> so um, I, I do I do have one question. Uh, Sunil several times has mentioned that there's no occupancy permit here, so I I, I, I you know. Okay, so for the record, there is a permit for this facility, and I, I think I see it back there. Um, but but you scared me a couple times, man. You don't say that on TV, and you don't. You just there's council members here. There's all kinds of folks here. In the beginning of December. Okay, okay. Um, no, really. Um, and and Mark's up here. I um, what a great day. And uh, I, I I was back in my office for a few minutes, and I was just thinking, um, again. Uh, this community, these partners, we have great bones. I mean, there's just there's good there's just great DNA here, you know. And there's there's leadership, and there's vision, and there's hard work, and there's belief, and there's all that stuff. And so, um, no different than what I said up here a couple hours ago. I I uh, I had a chance. The mayor and I went back to to uh, to our offices and talked a little bit about this. And this is a great day. And um, it is a privilege just to be part of it. And, and I look around the room and there, you know, I know most of you and, and, um, and I just thank you for your energy and your support for this community and for this, this initiative. And lots of people that could be thanked, I won't do that, but I just, uh, it's a privilege to be in this role, to be able to be up here and say thank you to you all and, and to just, uh, just see the amazing work. Um, I think everyone knows Mark uh, in a sphere, right? I, I got to get RMI squared out of my out of my uh, uh, my system, and um, so come on up, Mark. Um, 
uh, I appreciate this guy. He's a great leader. He has taken uh, this uh, this this um, this group this sort of. Um, from a from a virtual, we started out early on and many years ago as a virtual sort of incubator and have turned it into something that is spectacular, way, way beyond what uh, any of us could have ever imagined. And he had some great uh, leaders on his board and partners, and you all are around here. And I just appreciate appreciate what you guys are doing uh, to uh, to uh, to help Mark and support and. Um, Again, I want to say my job, I thought, was to say there is a party going on outside there, and I'm going to be done. So um, thank you all very much. Um, Sunil, you are awesome. We are so lucky. We are so lucky to have you and Spire here, and um, not to mention all the partners that were here and Mark and others. So um, I thank you for your support. I thank you for the Colorado Clean Energy support, the governor's office support. Um, uh, it's a big deal, and we really appreciate you as a partner in this in this community. So let's uh, let's say thanks to him. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Darren, for all of those kind words. And uh, I'll be probably the fifth or sixth to say, "Wow, what a great day today!" It's um, really an honor to uh, be hosting this important event today and have such a distinguished group of visitors literally two days after we open the door. So I think a lot of you will notice we're still putting the finishing touches on the building. We got the heat working reliably yesterday. And uh, like Sunil's demo, a lot of things came together at the very last minute to make this possible, but everything came off perfectly. So, so uh, this has just been great. Um, before we break for tours and the reception, I just want to say a few words about the building itself and, uh, and the Rocky Mountain Inosphere program. Um, this project is a culmination of about three years of effort by a real wide range of very dedicated people, too numerous to thank individually in the few minutes I have today. But I would like to single out a few contributors that really deserve some special recognition. Um, first off and foremost is the city of Fort Collins. Um, they've been truly extraordinary partners in this project and in promoting economic development, entrepreneurship, and our industry clusters in clean energy, uh, bioscience, and our newest one in water innovation. Uh, truly spectacular, world-class work um, by a city, very innovative. And uh, they've really been the catalyst in creating the vision that we all refer to as the Northern Colorado Innovation Economy and the fact that this community is actually walking the talk. Lots of communities around the country are talking about being clean energy innovation centers, but uh, this community with CSU, City of Fort Collins, and other leaders really have the goods to deliver on it. In addition to the leadership and vision, the other important ingredient, ingredient as uh, both Darren and Sunil mentioned, is collaboration. And collaboration is really something that's uh, built into the fabric of this community and all of the organizations working together on our innovation economy. And it's really one of the things that sets this community apart and makes us special. And I hear feedback from colleagues all over the state when I work with them that there's something special going on in Fort Collins and they want to know how their communities can get more of that. And I think that's a very special part of it. Um, very special thanks to Darren and uh, also CFO Mike Freeman of the city. They've both been very staunch supporters of both the Rocky Mountain Inosphere program and to all of our individual entrepreneurs and innovators in the community. Uh, it's really made a difference. And uh, very much a thank you to Mayor Hutchinson and all of the city council members who saw the wisdom in making a long-term investment in our economic health and uh, unanimously approved the funding and the support that made this project uh, possible and really kicked it off. Um, also like to thank the many, many city employees who assisted with everything uh, from the development review process, which we got through in record time, to uh, many of the design features of the building that uh, will make it one of the most energy efficient buildings in the entire city. When we began the project, um, we set three major goals. I just wanted to comment on those. Um, first of those is to provide an innovative space that nurtures the growth of our high potential entrepreneurial companies. And everything from the outdoor spaces to the common areas have been designed to promote a healthy workplace and maximize informal gatherings and collaborations uh, of our entrepreneurs and uh, kind of create those um, collaborations that lead to new innovations. We also set out to create a hub for entrepreneurial activity uh, and events for northern Colorado and the entire state. 
And uh, even though we haven't even barely opened the doors, we already have uh, major events uh, booked in this space from uh, like-minded groups that are promoting clean energy, bioscience, and uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, we're expecting to see a lot of activity and excitement coming out of this center over the coming year. And our third main goal was to create an energy efficiency and renewable energy showcase project. And I'm really cr uh, proud of our 50 kilowatt photovoltaic system we have in the building. It consists of the carports you may have seen in front, the canopy over the uh, front entryway, and the entire rooftop. And that's going to be going online uh, in a, a matter of days. And uh, we're real excited about that. And I'm especially proud that it was designed and built by one of our uh, client companies and tenants in the building, Virsal Solar. And, uh, and it also incorporates uh, technology from, uh, that came out of CSU um, from a bound solar. So really a nice showcase uh, and tribute to Northern Colorado innovation in our, um, our solar PV system. And uh, within a short time, it'll also incorporate electric vehicle uh, charging stations and everything will be connected to the uh, Sprays Network Operations Center, which will be located up on the third floor. So that'll be another uh, exciting event to mark, uh, mark that goal. And uh, also, I'm also very excited that uh, Virsal, uh, within a year or two, will be breaking ground on a new 20,000 square foot headquarters building, which is on the building pad, literally right behind me on the other side of the plaza area there. Um, and that's just a great example of the kind of economic activity that our program is designed to support. So um, that, that'll be a great event. And so those were our goals, and uh, now that this uh, multi-year effort has uh, come to fruition, I'm happy to report that not only did we meet the goals, but we really exceeded um, some of the goals in very significant ways. And I just wanted to point out a few highlights of the program over the past years. Uh, I guess first off, the financing of a project like this by a, a very lean nonprofit organization is, uh, is truly an act of innovation and required a lot of uh, creative thinking and hard work by a number of people. So in addition to people I've already mentioned, I want to thank Josh Burks, the city of uh, Fort Collins Economic Development Office, uh, Christina Vincent with the North College Urban Renewal Authority, and Masuda Omar with uh, Colorado uh, Housing and Finance Authority. I'd also like to thank U.S. Bank Corporation, um, which invested nearly $2 million in the project through the New Markets Tax Credit Program. And uh, U.S. Bank actually just informed us yesterday that they'll be featuring this project in their annual corporate citizenship report for 2011. So that's quite an honor. So uh, we'll try to get that distributed out when we get copies of those. Um, you know, in spite of having an, our share of surprises on a project of this size and complexity, uh, we actually completed the construction on exactly the date we targeted over a year ago, which was amazing. And even more amazing is that it was under budget, the entire project. So uh, I'd really like to thank the uh, management team. Uh, key players there were Dan Tweeten of Verde and David Stolte of Doan Construction. Amazing guys that kept the program on track uh, every day. Um, also, we set out a goal when we first talked to City Council of making this a lead gold uh, building, which is in, consistent with the city's uh, vision and strategy for new construction. Uh, but because of significant overachievement by uh, the team, we're now expecting to be certified as only the second lead platinum building in the city of Fort Collins within a couple of months. So great job by all the team. <laughs> And I want to add for that some special thanks to Josie Plott and the Institute for the Built Environment at CSU and Gary Schrader with the City of Fort Collins Utilities. Great contributors, great accomplishment for the team. Um, another big accomplishment, we budgeted for a 9 to 12 month leasing period uh, for the building uh, based on advice from our friends in commercial property. And uh, yet at this point, even though we haven't opened the doors, we've um, we have 17 leases either signed or nearly signed, and uh, we'll be at 90% occupancy when they all get moved in by the end of January. So um, we're very fortunate the demand is high, and a lot of people see value in, in being part of the center. So excited about that. And I uh, really want to thank my fellow RMI staff members, Nicole Franklin, Brian Dennis, and Kelly Peters for that, that significant accomplishment. And um, finally, given our limited budget for the project, we placed a real high emphasis on frugality, and we really expected this to be a very utilitarian uh, sort of building for the uh, budget we could afford. 
Um, yet due to the innovation of the creative design team, we ended up with a finished product that is you know, absolutely stunning and something the whole community can really be proud of. So a special thanks to Alexa Tachenko with Preview Architects and uh, Renee Sherman with Oglesby Sherman, the interior designer for the building. They did a fantastic job. Um, also like to make a special recognition for the contributions of uh, CSU. I think CSU is really the prime mover in a lot of the innovation in our clean energy and bioscience industries and responsible for a lot of uh, the fact that we're able to actually create this uh, economy and uh, all of the successes. And uh, they've also been a great partner for RMI. We work very closely with many different departments in CSU and they're, they're fully committed and they're as collaborative as all the other groups you've heard from today. Um, I've, I have many more thanks, but I think I'll save uh, most of the rest for our grand opening celebration, which will be happening sometime in uh, February. We still haven't had time to catch our breaths and set a date and plan that, but uh, we hope we see you all there. And we'll talk a lot more about our program and really highlight some of our entrepreneurs. They're doing amazing things, and that's really what it's all about. Um, we'll do more of that at our next celebration. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Sunil for a few closing words. And I uh, just want to say thank you all for attending this remarkable event today.